union's continued position against returning to in-person learning at this time. The last time I spoke during public comment back in early December, our community's average daily COVID case rate hovered around um, 50 cases or so per 100,000. Just a reminder that at 10 cases per 100,000, a town turns red on the Connecticut's state COVID map, red for danger, not for party time or fun. Um, things in town have certainly changed since then. Our case rate is now hovering around 100 cases per 100,000. We are in the middle of continued community spread. Thankfully, our schools have not tested whether or not the virus will spread in our classrooms and hallways with such high numbers. And now in the midst of rising case rates, we hear that the more contagious strain of COVID has been detected here in Connecticut. During this week's DPH and Department of Education conference call, DPH pandemic expert, Dr. Matt Carter, warned that this new COVID variant is one and a half times more transmissible and that by March, it may be widespread in the United States. He said that now is not the time to cut back on preventive measures. I consider remote learning one of those preventive measures. Tonight, we're meeting from the safety of our homes or from empty offices. I see Dr. Youngberg in her office. And since January 4th, our hardworking staff members have been teaching from the safety of their homes or from their empty classrooms. We urge you to keep our schools in a full virtual learning model until we see a consistent and significant decline in COVID-19 transmission in our community in order to best protect our staff and students. I just wanna say thank you to Dr. Youngberg for keeping the lines of communication open with her staff. And thank you to the board for the opportunity to speak. And that's all I have. Thank you, Cammie. Um, and uh, I'm open to anybody else who would like to speak during public comment. Anybody else? Either raise your hand or put it in the chat. I do. Who is that? Okay, whoever Hello, this uh, is, please please identify yourself. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, my name is Pedro Luna. Um, I live on Jackson Street. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go right ahead, All right, Mr. Great. Luna. All right, good evening. Um, I have three daughters enrolled in Wyndham Public School, two at North Wyndham School and one at Wyndham Early Childhood Center. Um, while I understand the concern for health and safety, the reality is that we are still nowhere near the end of this pandemic. The government continues to report that schools are safe and that the virus is not being transmitted in schools where mitigation strategies are being followed. Um, the rate of infection has not improved while students have been virtual. Parents need to work and children need to learn. I'm trying my best to support my children while they are at home, but know that they are falling further behind. Hybrid is, is not effective. Going back and forth between hybrid and virtual isn't working. Um, and students need stability in these uncertain times. I think the best option for the families to have the choice to have their children to be all virtual or, or full in person. The district has worked for years to raise student achievement and help more students be perform at grade level. By continuing the way we are operating during the pandemic, we are ensuring an even harder road ahead. I strongly encourage you all to think about this as you make plans for the future and the upcoming school year. Thank you. Thank um, you very much. 
Go ahead. Yeah, no problem. No, go uh, ahead, Mr. Luna. No. Uh, I just wanted to add just, you know, I think you should really, you know, take a look at the data um, that's being presented. Uh, <clears throat> the governor also has suggested, you know, even though the towns have their own, uh, the towns could, you know, decide whether or not go virtual, hybrid, or in person. Um, <clears throat> at the end of that meeting, um, he had put up slides or data showing that, you know, schools don't have, um, it doesn't show that, that people are getting infected in schools. I mean, quite frankly, I, the way I feel right now, uh, the people that are voting no or to have it all in person, I mean, all virtual, are, are technically the same people, not for nothing, that are going out, you know, still going to other places, um, per se, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, going to going to restaurants, eating out, you know, gathering with friends, um, but they all but but they want to do all virtual. Um, you know, I think schools is one of the most safest um, places to be at, uh, and it's controlled. It's a controlled environment with the cohorts that are going on with the kids, uh, making sure that parents don't come in uh, into the schools and taking the necessary precautions. Um, I think it's the safest place for a teacher and a student to be in. Um, when you go to a restaurant, you don't really know who's going in and out. So that's not a, that's not really controlled, you know? Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. But, you. you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody's having a tough time and uh, no matter what, we'll get through it. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Luna. Appreciate you weighing in. Um, Nicole Bay has her hand up. Good evening. Um, hi there, Nicole Bay. We can't, we can't hear you. Is Nicole Bay speaking and we just can't hear her? She's trying to get it unmuted. It looks like it's not working for her. Okay. Um, could we we'll wait a second and if you can't get unmuted, I'll skip over to Kathleen Colgen who has her hand up and then come back to you. Yeah, she's saying to skip her and try to come back. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Kathleen Colgen. Kathleen, do you not have your hand up in reality and that's a mistake? Okay, is there anybody else who would like to speak? Put it in the chat maybe. Oh, oh, her settings won't let her in. Okay, I'm very sorry. Hmm. She can't unmute. Is there some, is there, there isn't a control on this from the, from the, from us centrally. So I don't know what the issue is. Lynn Beth Prose has her hand up. Okay. Thank hi Lynn. You, but, but before we, hi Beth, before you speak, um, Kathleen and Nicole, we'll come back to you if you can figure this out. Thank you. So, so yeah, Lynn, just ahead. to let you know, Kathy is showing as unmuted on our end. So as I tried to get Janet to unmute her, but it says she's unmuted. So I don't know if it's her own computer. Okay. Well, we're sorry, Kathleen and Nicole, but if you if you rectify the situation, let us know. Um, we're gonna go. Oh, Nicole has rectified. I was able the situation. to join audio. Okay, so now I'm gonna come back to you, Beth, in a few minutes. Okay, Nicole. Hi, my name is Nicole Bay, and I am a parent of a North Windham student and also the STEM coach over at Barrows. And um, I couldn't be happier right now to not be in a major decision-making position because this is incredibly difficult. Um, and I appreciate all of you who have to be in those positions and for the decisions that you're making um, to keep us all safe. My kid needs to go to school. I, I'm just going to say that because I need her to go to school. She needs to go to school. 
However, my big concern is by bringing all of our kids into school, yes, they're safer there. Yes, they need to learn. But what happens when staff members are out? Um, right before Christmas break, we had several staff members who were out and we were scrambling to fill those positions. Um, and I just, I worry about um, the possibility of a, pos of a school not having enough staff to cover and then ending up having to go remote for the day. Um, that would be a bigger disruption to parents than the hybrid model or us being fully virtual. So like I said, I'm really glad I don't have to make those decisions, but I hope that um, parents and community members and the teachers and administrators understand how difficult it will be if we don't have the staff to run our buildings. And like I said, this is coming from someone who believes we need to be there. My child needs to go and I need to see my kids. Um, so I'm just glad not to be in this position, but there are so many things to consider when you make this decision. So please take the time to consider all of those. Thank you very much. And um, Laura Perez Handler has put in the chat, if someone can't join the audio, they can always call in at 1-929-205-6099. And the meeting ID is 899-501-1284. And the passcode is 690040. Um, I just wanted to read that out loud because if you're not on video, you can't see these chats. So is there anybody who would like to speak via phone? Oh, Mark Doyle has joined us. Great, Mark. Thank you. Anybody and else want to speak? Had, Beth Prose has had her hand up, Lynn. Oh, that's right. Thank you for reminding me. Um, Beth, you're all yellow this evening. That's very interesting. I know. I guess that's the paint of the, of the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Prose. I live at 255 High Street in Willimannock. I had um, three children that attended uh, Wyndham Public Schools from pre-K to grade 12 and all really benefited and flourished from their education there. Um, I'm advocating at this time uh, for full virtual schooling um, due to the alarming town metrics. Uh, we're living through a pandemic, and I believe that we need to focus on safety first. And um, with the, I am hopeful that with the um, vaccine, and it seems like it's really rolling out rather quickly, that hopefully we can go back to school safely as soon as possible. But for the current um, situation that we're in, I believe that we need to just focus a little bit longer on on safety and focusing on keeping each other safe and healthy. And um, hopefully we'll be out of this sooner than later. And I echo what um, all the rest of the people have said here that I'm glad I'm not in a decision-making role <laughs> because I think this is extremely difficult. And um, I understand that whatever you decide, it's gonna be difficult. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, thank you, Beth. Is there anybody else who would like to speak during public comment? Lynn, I think I've found my microphone. Oh, wonderful. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Sorry, it was my privacy settings earlier. This is Kathleen Colgen. Um, I live in Willimantic and teach at Wyndham High School. And I want to thank Cami for representing our members' concerns so well. As I was listening um, to community comments, I, I just wanna address the concept that schools are not vectors of transmission. I think the evidence we have to date in our community suggests that our schools have not been, and I wanna commend everyone who works in our schools and our students who have been attending for their careful, careful following of recommendations, but we are really in unchartered waters right now. We have never had community transmission rates this high. We have a brand new, highly transmiss transmissible variant of the disease in our state, and we simply do not know. Uh, every day that goes by, we seem to learn something new about this disease, and two new studies came out in early January suggesting that while schools have perhaps been perceived as not being places of transmission, they actually are 
once the rate in the community rises. And that is exactly where we are right now. Um, we are more than twice where we were when we shifted to fully remote and our cases are rising daily rather than starting to decline. And I really urge you to take the safety of not just our staff members, but of our students and our whole community um, into consideration and urge you to keep schools fully remote. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. I'm glad you figured it out. It was nice to hear from you. Um, is there anybody else who would like to speak? Raquel Luna? Yes, go right ahead. Hi, good evening. Um, so I'm going to totally veer off course. <laughs> Um, and just avoid everything relating to the pandemic. But um, I just wanted to thank um, Robinson Camacho and um, his whole team of family liaisons for the awesome event for Three Kings Day. Um, my kids really enjoyed it. Um, it was definitely like a positive thing, um, especially in this crazy time that we're all in. And they were really excited to see everybody um, thank you to the three kings. I believe it was Mr. Pavone, um, Mr. Weathers, and who's the other one? Oh, uh, Mr. Camacho, Jose Camacho. Um, I hope I got it right. But um, <laughs> but no. They looked very dapper in their outfits, didn't they? It was exciting for me to try to figure out who it was. Um, the kids didn't really know. But um, no, so it was really exciting, and they loved seeing their principal. And so I just wanted to say thank you. Um, and that was it. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak during public comment? Okay. Seeing none, as people know, we have we have a public comment at the end of the meeting also. And um, so now we're going to start working through the rest of the agenda. The first order of business is approval of the Board of Education meeting minutes from December 9th, 2020. Make I'm a motion to approve, Ms. Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. I uh, know that's okay. Uh, who would like to second? Ilda. Okay, Ilda seconding um, second. the motion that's on the floor. Are there any comments? or corrections, discussion regarding the minutes? Lynn, I just had one correction. Um, Kimmy Nyland Poirier's, Poirier part of her last name was spelled incorrectly, um, but that's all I saw. Okay. I'm sure it happens to you all the time, Kimmy. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'm sure Janet has noted that. And is there anything else? Okay, hearing nothing else, we'll take a roll call vote, please, Janet. Ms. I. I. Dr. Gallucci. I. Mr. Doyle. I. Ms. Lambert. I. Ms. Ray. I. Ms. Haney. I. Uh, Ms. Dunnick, have you joined us? No. Thank you. Hasn't. So that's it. That's Thank it. you very much. Um, so now we're on to the superintendent's reports. And um, just I want to, like before Dr. Youngberg starts, I want to just say that we don't have any formal discussion items that were, that was, that were noticed on this agenda. But um, what I would like to do when we get um, to discussion items is open it up to board discussion regarding the COVID situation um, after we hear Dr. Youngberg's report. So while Dr. Youngberg is reporting, I think we'll leave it to just any like burning questions and then we'll reserve the discussion for the discussion part of the agenda. Um, and I just wanna make clear that we don't have an action item on this topic tonight on the agenda. Um, my approach to this is when things are as emotional and you know and new like this the information we get we need to absorb a little bit before we um, take any action if we want to take any action so I'm going to try to reserve this to discussion tonight and we can schedule a special meeting if we feel we need to um, 
or we can um, uh, do what we've done in the past is um, convey our our, our feelings to the superintendent and and uh, leave it to her to make the decision, which is the pattern that we've been using thus far, and the one that I think we should try to use continually. So um, uh, let's open it up to you, Dr. Youngberg. Thanks, Lynn. Good evening, everyone. Um, Lynn, do you want me to continue using going down the agenda in the order, so start with celebrations, or do you want me to jump right into the COVID report? I think you can go with the celebrations. Okay. Um, and then, you know, maybe we could change up the order and then finish up with COVID and then go into discussion. How about that? Sounds good to me. Okay. Okay. I'm sharing my screen, so hopefully everybody can see the celebrations presentation. Just change it up so I can see all your faces at the same time. Okay, so the first um, shout out is to the Wellness Zone Committee. Uh, or I should say the wellness zone, cam wellness zone campaign, um, the fact that we've been really trying to offer opportunities for our staff members uh, to have some wellness Wednesdays opportunity for some self-care. It's completely voluntary. I see lots of smiling faces, well, and some smiling eyes under the mask in that screen. So um, just a shout out on our self-care activities and all the staff members that have been involved in trying to help make this insane time a little more manageable. So kudos. Along those same lines, um, we have a shout out to Erin Westerman, who uh, there's a nice picture of her. I see her. I see you down on the screen there. I, uh, she also has an amazing Bitmoji. I don't know if you've all seen her Bitmoji that does yoga. It's really cute. Um, but congratulations to her um, for offering the bilingual yoga, which is, again, part of our Wellness Wednesdays and an opportunity for um, our staff members and also the community. She's opening it up uh, to the community as well, coming up soon. So. Um, Kudos, we, we appreciate your work, Erin. Go team. Uh, the district has received a total of 151 free masks from mass.com and Hanes. Uh, so we appreciate any donations. We know uh, we're going through them like crazy. So we definitely appreciate donations. Another, lots of smiling faces in this screen. Um, this is the group that is working to uh, improve uh, anti-racism, uh, anti-bias culture in our district. They're actually working um, on how not to be an how to be an anti-racist. So you can tell they must have told them that they were taking this picture because there's no way everyone on a Zoom is smiling at the same time unless they told a joke or something. So great picture. Congratulations to that team. That is an offshoot of our or or along with our diversity and equity inclusion uh, committee that's going on. So shout out to all the staff members involved there. That's wonderful. Uh, these two ladies who I see every single day at 315 have been our COVID warriors. Um, they really are the ones that are behind the scenes doing all the work in our contact tracing. And when I share the COVID information, they are where we're getting the data from. So kudos to these two ladies, Tara Webb and Kristen Gooden. We truly appreciate all the work they've been putting in um, since the beginning of the school year. Uh, and it's nonstop work, so everyone knows it doesn't stop at four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock. They're taking calls all hours of the night and on the weekends and we really appreciate them. So I see, I see hands clapped around there. That's great. Uh, Wyndham Center held a drive organized by Jarrah Reese uh, to give holiday presents to 25 local children from the Salvation Army's Angel Tree Tag. So those boxes and boxes of presents, always nice to see. North Wyndham School recognizes their social workers, Nicole Campanelli and Cade uh, LaMontagne for their efforts in organizing the Giving Tree Project, which provided four North Wyndham families in need this holiday season. So kudos, NWS staff, nice job. Love good humans. Up oh, there's Pajama Day for North Wyndham, Sweeney and Wyndham Center School. They all participated and made a donation uh, to the Children's Medical Center. I just love the idea of raising money because you get to wear pajamas. I just think that's like the best idea anybody ever came up with. You tell I was an elementary principal before. Well, since uh, we I, meet virtually, we could do it. We could wear our pajamas to our Zoom meetings and raise yeah, money. They, they might frown on me coming to work like that, but I, I hear you. We could make it work. Uh, North Wyndham School had a food drive as well uh, and donated three boxes of non-perishable foods to the Covenant Soup Kitchen for the holidays. So kudos again, North Wyndham School. We appreciate that. Um, in place of their in-person concert, because you know we can't have those, Wyndham Center School created a musical winter gift, and this is a picture of their virtual gift. Um, I had a chance to, to watch this video, really, really sweet. 
So congratulations to um, Mr. Rodriguez. Uh, I think it's Rodriguez Anaya. Um, and we appreciate, you'll see there's another one in here. We appreciate any time we can incorporate music into the students' lives, they, they really uh, respond very well to it. Sort of the adults. Here's another example when I'm early childhood, um, doing their paranda the day before winter break. So cute. And here's Nachaga School um, following suit. I don't know if anybody got a chance to see this video as well, but they had a whole lot of staff members um, and students doing their thing to music. Really appreciate that. That's Mr. Cologne's work at Nachaga School. Window High School leadership team, um, the Whippet, in the Whippet spirit, uh, presented a happy holidays to the to the high school Whippets uh, message that they um, everyone gave a little message, a video message. Again, because we can't be together, we figured out virtual ways to celebrate um, and connect with one another. So we we appreciate all they've done at the high school to do that. And, and along the lines of awesome bitmojis, here's another one from Natchog School. Michelle Dupuy and Mr. Eben Jones, just love it. Not to mention the teachers all at the bottom here. Um, they actually created a virtual open house um, with each teacher having their own bitmoji. Um, I suggest if you haven't seen it to take a chance to look through it, it's really cute. Food service workers, we've been celebrating them since last March 16th because they really have been just amazing heroes in all this. Um, but they served over a thousand meals over the holiday break. Um, and if you just look at the setup, they're waiting for meals to be picked up. That is a propane heater behind them because it's freezing outside. And that's where they're standing so the cars can quickly drive through and pick up what they need. They have that little heater that's supposed to be keeping their, their backsides warm while they're waiting for the, for the families to show up. So we really do appreciate food services. They have gone above and beyond since we closed down in March. Wyndham Regional Community Council made a donation so that family liaisons could provide 10 more families with meals during the holidays. So again, uh, another amazing uh, work of good humans. And here's another example of the, the same kind of idea, um, just trying to really reach out and support the community as best they can. So uh, celebrating all the work that the Family Resource Center at Nachog is doing or has done. And I know um, here's Wyndham High School students created some, some uh, Christmas cards, holiday cards, and donated to the local, uh, to let's see, nursing homes, no free shelter in the Covenant Soup Kitchen. So in Wyndham Hospital, congratulations to all those students and to Ms. Copley for being involved in that process. And I know, oh, there's more, I must've missed one, okay. Uh, Sweeney Elementary School, the students drew and colored in templates to create beautiful cards and spread the holiday cheer, again, for the local nursing homes, which I'm sure in this, with all that's going on, I'm sure they could use every bit of uh, holiday cheer that, that anybody could send them. This, I am proud to say, is the honor roll uh, for marking period one. And it is nice to see as many students on here as are listed. Congratulations to every single one of these students. We know that so many of our students are really struggling with the current model. Um, so it's nice to see that people are, that students are rising above and, and um, you know, earning that kind of honor, high honors and regular honor roll. So congratulations to those students. And I know one of the public comments was about our Three Kings celebration. Um, and we'll have that in next month's celebration because it just happened on Saturday, but I suppose I could share who the three kings were because I happened to, to know that it was Mr. Pabone, Mr. Jose, Jose Camacho, and Mr. Neil Weathers. So those were the three gentlemen that stood outside in the freezing cold um, to greet all the people that came up, and you'll see them celebrated at next month's board meeting. And the wind was blowing too, so... Oh, yeah, it was cold and we had an amazing turnout. Um, the, the staff members that showed up, we had representation from every single school, multiple departments. They really did show up to, to say that we are all a team through this crazy, crazy time. All right, so any other questions about district celebrations or should I move on to the next presentation? Any questions, board members, aside from kudos to everybody involved in all of those things? Okay, you can keep going. Why don't we jump ahead, jump ahead of COVID and go down to the other areas. Okay, so first. skip COVID and go yeah. to, all right. So the board members received an update on the core program in their packet. Um, are there any questions about the core program? I know we have Suzanne Craw on the line if specific questions came up about the program, but if the board members don't have questions, 
I can move on or if you'd like to have, you know, to, to ask anything specific about the report on the core program. Any questions, board members? No, and I encourage you if you, Ilda, did you, did you, were you about to say something? No? Okay. Okay. Thank you for the written report. I know at some point, you know, we'll have a more full discussion about this and other programs, but um, right now, I guess nobody has any questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and the same holds true with the, in your packet were the first readings of policy 4213.6, 6172.6, and 1313. If any of the board members have specific things they'd like addressed about those policies, I am all ears. This is the first reading of the policies. We're not taking action on them this evening, but it is a time to raise any questions or concerns um, for the policy team um, before we do uh, a second reading at, a, one of, at our next meeting. Okay. Okay, not hearing anything. We'll move forward to the COVID-19 update, which will then roll into discussion. Okay. All right, I have shared my screen. Hopefully you can all see it. Okay, so um, the majority of this uh, presentation is focused on COVID and there's a couple slides about the school or a slide about the school budget process, where we are with that, as well as the elementary school consolidation plan. Just giving everyone a, a general overview of where we are. Um, I know everyone on this call mostly wants to hear what's happening with COVID. I totally get it. It's sort of all encompassing at this point. Okay, so right now the current plan is, we are where the red arrows, arrow says, we are at Wednesday, uh, January 13th. It is a virtual flex day for us. The plan right now is for us to return in person to cohort A on the 21st, um, so a week from tomorrow. The plan is for the students to come back. Uh, this evening at five o'clock, I had um, a municipal call with the governor that either happens bi-weekly or weekly, depending on what's happening with the surge. Um, right now, I think it's back up to weekly. Uh, the State Department of Public Health Director uh, told us that we are currently experiencing the highest levels on the seven day average since the second wave started. Um, the State Department of Public Health is extremely concerned about the Eastern Connecticut numbers um, they shared some information that didn't make me all that happy about the vaccine. Um, they still haven't officially identified who the frontline essential workers are. It sounds like teachers are definitely included in that group, um, but whether or not other educators are included is still not clear. Supposedly an announcement is coming out tomorrow where they're going to clarify who exactly is in phase 1B. Uh, the part that was sort of depressing for me, and I hope I'm sort of secretly hoping that the new uh, president-elect, when he comes in, things will change, but they shared that in, in phase 1B, there's more than a million people who are within that group. So that's people over 65, people over 65 with comorbid conditions, people over 75, essential frontline workers, and there may be an, um, um, people who are living in a congregate setting who weren't covered in phase 1A. So more than a million people, but the state is currently only receiving 44,000 vials of vaccine per week. So if you do the math, that is going to take us months to get through that group alone. So that was not what I wanted to hear, um, sort of kind of depressed about that. So this is sort of like our one, you know, shining hope that this was coming. Um, so they are trying to work right now on getting a third vaccine approved so that they could produce or I don't, they didn't really say whether it was a production issue or a distribution issue, but clearly there's an issue if you need a million and you're only getting 44,000 a, a week. Um, they did make mention of the UK variant that was mentioned in public, in the public comment at the beginning of this. Um, I'm going to talk about that in, in the fifth slide. They talked about the mitigation strategies being extremely important moving forward. Um, and they were, were uh, clear to mention that the access to the vaccinations are being pushed out with an equity lens. They are paying close attention to people of low socioeconomic standing, of people who coming from communities of color, uh, people who might not have technology access to make sure that they're really figuring out how to get 
or, or even if it's not technology access, just being able to, to navigate technology, they don't want to leave anyone out of being uh, able to access the, vac the vaccine. So they also let us know that the Biden administration is expected to push out their vaccine plan on Friday the 14th. So again, I'm hoping that that plan is better than what is giving them 44,000 vials a week for the million people. So this all happened at five o'clock today. Um, so I'm just bringing you up to speed. The rest of the presentation I had prepared over the last day or two, but this was you know late breaking. All right, in terms of the vaccination update, um, just a reminder that all the vaccines are currently approved for emergency use only, um, and they're not mandated for our employees. In fact, the attorneys sort of talked us through that, and we had a, the superintendents had a webinar uh, on Monday about that, um, because employers are actually allowed to mandate vaccinations and immunizations. We're not doing that yet, um, and I think it has to do with the fact that they're only approved for emergency use at this point. It's not something that's going you know, it's not like the flu shot that's been happening year after year, um, but more to come on that. Just letting the board know that our school nurses have received their first round of vaccine, um, and they are actually going to be vaccinating our own staff members, which I think is an amazing idea. Um, the de local health department asked if I had a problem with that, and, and I volunteered them, said absolutely not. I even volunteered them to help with the town vaccinations without really telling them till after. I don't know if they're still mad at me about that, but... Um, they will be vaccinating their own staff members, which I hope helps in this whole craziness. Uh, I will be pushing out a formal communication to the staff later on this week, either tomorrow or Friday. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of questions that are unanswered. I'm hoping the governor's message tomorrow answers some more of the questions, and then maybe the president-elect's um, message on Friday answers even more, um, because there's a lot of things employees are asking us that we don't have the answer to. We do know that the vaccine, according to DPH, is up to 95% effective in stopping a vaccinated person from getting the virus. The clinical trials did not address whether you could carry the virus and pass it. So they don't actually know that. Obviously, if it's 95% effective of, of stopping you from getting the virus, you're highly unlikely to get it, right? You have a 5% chance of getting it, but they don't know if you can be asymptomatic and transmitting it. So that's another interesting little twist and turn. Um, the vaccine DPH has reported can cause side effects. Most vaccines have side effects, but the large majority of the people who have taken them so far have experienced minor or no side effects at all. Um, and in our uh, DPH meeting, we have one of those every Tuesday morning, and that's the, what Cami was referencing in her, because uh, she, she now attends those. Um, they did state that the vaccine is effective against the new strain. Um, DPH confirmed that. Moving along the lines of the new strain. So the UK variant, they also referred to it as the B117 strain. Um, it is in Connecticut. DPH was not surprised that, it, that it's here. They seem to expect that it was gonna be here. They do um, say it's one and a half times more contagious than the original COVID uh, virus. They basically described it as being more efficient. So it, it does a better job of actually making you sick. So, um, and because you can catch it, you're more likely to catch it now, they, they're suggesting there may be more positive cases uh, than were originally um, created with the old strain. They, they, we specifically asked, and Cami knows because I sent, the, I sent the questions up in an email to DPH and they literally read my questions on the DPH call. They answered every one of our questions. They said there are no changes that they're recommending to schools in terms of mitigation strategies. So in other words, everything we're already doing according, according to the State Department of Public Health is what we should continue to do in terms of being in, you know, offering in-person school. Um, they did again in this call restate the, the need to be completely vigilant about those mitigation strategies. Don't, you know, they, they, Dr. Carter and all of them said the same thing. We, you have to be really careful because it is more contagious, so you need to continue the same mitigation strategies. And again, they reinforced the idea that the current vaccine is effective against the UK variant. All right, so case rates were mentioned in the public comment to start off, and you can see here in this chart, um, Wyndham is close to the top, 90.8 cases per 100,000. Basra is actually past the 100 mark. Um, so on the left-hand side of this chart are all the districts um, that are up there with us in terms of having a really high case rates. 
and on the right side of the chart is what's happening with them in terms of what they've decided for a learning model. So you can see Basra, like Wyndham, is scheduled to go back, uh, currently scheduled to return to hybrid on January 21st. Hampton, which is just below us, is in person right now. New Britain is fully remote, remote with a plan to return back to hybrid on January 19th. New London is full remote until February 1st. Meriden is in person for grades K to eight uh, and in hybrid for the high school. Plainfield is in the hybrid model. Norwich is in hybrid. Norwich Free Academy is fully remote. And you can just go down the list and see. So uh, there is really no, uh, well, there's, there's no rhyme or reason as to what's given them, the, what's made the decisions on, on the learning model based on numbers, but you can see that we have full in person all the way up to fully remote and everything in between. So just letting you all know that this is the latest data. I actually had Mr. Weathers on the phone today calling districts to verify to make sure we had the most up-to-date information. Um, and, and we did include a large number of Alliance districts in this chart because Alliance districts have similar demographics to us um, and would be experiencing similar things in their communities when it comes to the virus. And I don't know if I should be stopping for questions or just keep going, Lynn, or? I, I, I think if people have a burning question about something that's on the screen, they should, they should ask from the board um, okay. while you're going through. So is there anything anybody has a question about so far that's been presented? Well, it allowed you to take a sip of your Thank you. Yeah, take a little breath. Beverage. Keep going. Okay. All right. Today's data as of 315, uh, this is what we have. We have 51 students who are either in quarantine or isolation and 10 staff members. And you'll notice that next to the student uh, numbers are the number of students who are virtual. And it, later on in the slide, you're going to see that we have a fair percentage of students who are fully virtual who are in quarantine or isolation or have tested positive. So. I, I'm going to tell you, tell the group again, and you'll see a slide about it. We have, we go through this data every single day and track it very carefully. We do not believe the virus is being spread in our schools. We can see it's being spread through families, and we know that there are often people who have who have made a decision not to send their kids to school who are still potentially doing things outside of school that are putting them uh, in the position to get the virus. And it's nobody's fault if you get the virus. It's a virus. It's, you know, it's something human beings face, will face for the rest of your entire life. There's going to be something trying to make you sick. Um, but we are seeing a fair number of kids who aren't coming to school, even when we're offering hybrid, who are testing positive for the virus that they're getting from other places. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we have a daily meeting every day of the COVID team. Uh, hopefully everyone by now has had a chance to see the new COVID dashboard. Uh, we set up that dashboard for complete and total transparency. We've put, uh, Laura has been amazing at pushing out the information through text messages and emails so you don't have to hear my voice every day, um, but you're still getting the, the updates on what's happening there. I report out to the WFT, which happens to be the district's largest bargaining unit, so I feel like I'm getting a chunk of people are getting the information every single day. Um, my COVID team is doing an amazing job uh, with contact tracing, and they are on the phone every single day, multiple times a day, or on email with our local health department. So far, our district has had, and you can see right here, as of uh, January 13th, today, we have had 211 students test positive and 46 staff members. Um, interesting, I think the mindset, or I think sometimes people think that the students are the ones who are going to be, you know, they're gonna have more students testing positive than staff, but right now it's just a, the staff are just slightly ahead in terms of percentages. The resolve cases means all of the kids or all of the staff members who were in quarantine, who were in isolation, and who are now either no longer positive, no longer quarantined, no longer isolated, all finished. So we have, as a district, dealt with a large number of cases. And again, I can't say enough about our COVID warriors, um, Tara Webb and Kristen Gooden, who have been doing all the work behind the scenes, and all of our school nurses, actually. Um, it's, it's really amazing, the stuff they've been doing. Uh, here's the data point I just mentioned earlier. 211 positive students, 40%, nearly 40% of them, or 80 positive cases, the students were fully virtual. So and, and of the 257 cases we have dealt with as a district, there is one case 
There was one case back in November um, where we believe there could possibly have been school transmission. Every other case, because we track it on a calendar and you're tracking when people get sick, when they're showing symptoms, when they're being tested, you can't, you, you can't make up the story about whether they've got, you know, th there's one case where it is possible. There's no way for us to prove it, but that's the one case where when we look at it on paper, you say, wow, it looks like this person could have transmitted the virus to this person, the timeline works. That's one case out of 257. That's real Wyndham data. And similar data is happening all over the state, which is why the Department of Public Health continues to say that schools are safe places to be. I'm not saying- okay, There's a question in the chat that um, says, says uh, how can you determine if it was transmit, transmitted in school or not? I don't know if, if there's one of the nurses on the line who would like to answer that question or- uh, so, Dr. Youngberg, one answer. All, all I can tell you, like in, in terms of the one case where we believe it was transmitted in school, I can tell you that none of the people who tested positive for the virus had any other people in their family who tested positive for the virus. So it, we are assuming that if you didn't get it at your house, which is viruses spread through homes very easily, if you didn't get it at the house, then you, if we, if you were in a classroom with someone that had the virus and you ended up testing positive in a similar timeline a few days later that you may have gotten the virus from that person in the class. Suzanne, do you have anything to add? Because I know you're deeply involved with the COVID warriors. I can jump in there too, Dr. Oh, there's, Youngberg. Okay, there's Tara, yep. <laughs> um, it just, in part of our contact tracing, we kind of see if there is any close contacts within the school for one. So we would know that if who any positive person, who they had contact with in our school district or in the school setting, um, and we also know the stories. It's not like we just take a positive and take it as a positive. We want to know why did they go get tested? Did they have symptoms? Who else do they know in their home life that might be positive? So through collecting all of that data, it can kind of make us um, put those puzzle pieces together. And <clears throat> I have lots of, we have, we, we track all of this. Kristen is oversees all, all of our spreadsheets and all of this data. Um, so that we can kind of look back and say like, huh, that, that seems like, I feel like that has, has a connection. Um, and we do group them by, by incident. So if we did have a positive uh, student or teacher, we know all of those in a line who right below them, who was, who was a close contact. And we track to see if they get tested. What, did their test come back positive or negative? If it did, do they have any other contacts outside of the home? Um, so that's kind of the, the information that's allowing us to see whether or not there is in-school transmission or not. And, and another question is, how does the school get the test results, Tara Webb? So we get them from multiple sources. Um, so the local health department uh, provides us with every positive test result that they receive um, from, from tiny, from age one through age 19. Um, and obviously a lot of those 19 year olds, they'll have graduated. Um, but any, any Wyndham Willimantic resident that is, a, that is a student, student age, right down to the early childhood, um, early head start. And then for staff, we, we do have to rely on our staff to give us that information. Um, so all of our grownups, you know, report that either to their, their school nurse or to, um, to myself or Kristen you know, sometimes they'll report it to their supervisor. Their supervisor will then tell us and we follow up. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Youngberg, you wanna keep moving through? Sure. So as I mentioned, uh, when we were celebrating the number of students that made honor roll for the first um, marking period, we do have some significant concerns with student attendance. And just so the board knows, and I think we've already sort of discussed this, but students are marked present whether they're coming in person or accessing learning virtually. And so this is a chart of the district attendance rate compared to last year. So the same week uh, in 2020 compared to the same, the, that exact same week this year in 2021. So um, the, the difference between those two is a total of 276 fewer students in attendance the first week of school. Um, which is troublesome, right? If kids are not engaged and not showing up for school, they can't be accessing learning, which creates a whole cycle of things that are going on. And now, some people would say, well, you can't compare last year's data to this year's data. We're in the middle of the pandemic. So we've broken out the data even further and we, 
first we've done a, a look at each school um, and some of our schools in red here should be commended uh, North Wyndham School uh, Barrows and the high school this particular week you somehow those schools managed to have less than a 5% decrease when looking at that week the year prior um, to this year. So that's really impressive, I think, given the pandemic situation. But we break it out by school and we take a look at what's going on. So you can see that some schools are hit even harder um, by the attendance piece. Um, and then we go even further and we look, we've looked at each week we've been in school, whether we've been in hybrid or in virtual. Um, so the colored bands on your screen are the weeks that we moved to a virtual environment. The, the, there are two weeks in October, two weeks in November, or week in November, week in December. And then we started the first week in January. So we are looking at every school's data um, because, you know, attendance isn't the only measure, but if they're not showing up, we know we don't have a chance in terms of getting them what they need. So some schools can see um, increases if when we move to virtual there's a couple schools on there that their attendance actually got better when we moved to virtual um, and some schools got significantly worse so uh, we need the kids to show up because we are concerned about them getting their assignments done getting what they need being connected not feeling isolated um, and you know in terms of the high school being able to earn high school credit so they graduate on time which creates another issue. So we are tracking data in every way imaginable and I have to celebrate April um, because she's the one that pulls all this data together for us. I saw Tracy had her hand up, I think. Yeah. Is it okay to ask a question now? Are you ready for it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, what strategies are we using to contact parents? I mean, at the elementary level, it's different than the high school and the middle school level. A lot of high school kids get left alone if their families go to work and if they don't log on, the parents may not be aware of it. Have we, did we start in like September making phone calls if students weren't logging on? Are we doing it now because we're at the halfway point, which may be too late for some kids who are already failing? How are we addressing, depending on grade level and independence basically, how we're getting in contact with these students? So we have been actually tracking this from the very beginning. Um, I, I don't know if there's any of the principals that wanna speak up and share, but there's a number of things, including actually going to the house and knocking on the door and saying your kids is not showing up virtually on the screen. But I don't know if any of the principals wanna share specific strategies. Um, I see. Tracy, I can share if you'd like. Go ahead. Sure. So th there's a couple of things that we do um, we've been monitoring our, our school meets every week. We have an attendance committee that consists of the social workers, myself, family liaison, assistant principal. Um, we contact, we actually um, work directly with all of our grade levels. Um, we have a, um, a checkoff list where teachers um, go through a process by which they ensure contact. Um, and then after a certain number of contacts, if it, that isn't made, then we begin other steps. So whether that's family liaison visiting, whether we make the phone call, additional phone calls, um, sometimes just simply finding out what's going on. Um, sometimes it's a computer issue and so they're not popping on for one reason or another, it has nothing to do with anything directly associated with what's happening within the home outside of a tech issue. So once we figure out what that is, then we determine what the next steps are. That's been pretty successful. Kids want to be in school. Um, and so, and you know, our teachers are doing a great job in trying to keep them and maintain them there. So we're just trying to all work together. And I think the more involvement that we all have and we ensure that our kids, we tell them we want you here, whether it's virtual or whether it's in person. Um, we had our recognition ceremonies last week and we, we you know, do our attendance and perfect attendance and excellent attendance awards. And we still do that even while we're remote. So um, I think that piece is helping us keep at least our levels as high as we can. It's hard. We do have a group of kids that are still not coming to school and we're attacking those beginning next week by grade levels, depending on the pockets that we see throughout the building. Um, thank you. Mark Doyle has a question. Yeah, uh, Dr. Youngberg, how firm have we been with the high school students just to pre-warn them that if they don't get their attendance up, they're in, in danger of not graduating? So, I, I don't want to have a surprise come in May when all of a sudden these students find out they don't have enough credits. So I know one of the things the high school's been doing is bi-weekly progress reports, but I'll let Pam jump in and share anything else. But I know that they literally been giving kids progress reports every two weeks. So, I mean, that's a very unusual uh, intervention, but I think it's helpful for them to know 
that we're watching what's happening. Do you have anything to add, Pam? Or can you not unmute? Oh, there you go. Yes, um, we've been issuing progress reports every two weeks. Like Tracy said, um, I know that our teachers are working um, tirelessly uh, providing supports to the students and especially on those Flex Wednesdays being available to them. Uh, like Liz was talking about, our attendance outreach um, currently we're making, we have a attendance brigade of phone calls every single morning after period one calling all of the students who didn't attend period one. And we actually now have separated out the root causes for the attendance issues and we have into piles. And like, for instance, one of the piles that we have that our social workers are working with is um, a pile that says, it's actually labeled distressed parents because the parents are the parents are in need. So our social workers are working out to them, and we have several categories that we're uh, getting supports to families out. Thanks, Pam and Liz. All right. Okay, let's keep moving through. Okay, just one last thing on this last slide. Just want to remind everyone that this is a lot of numbers, but the numbers represent students. So there's a drop in attendance. It's little bodies or it could be big bodies too, right? That aren't showing up, that aren't getting what they need. So I just wanna make that, that point. All right, there've been um, some changes to the quarantine recommendations and changes to the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act. Um, the CDC recommends that we reduce the 14 day quarantine to 10 days. I have checked in with our local health district and the nurses checked in with our medical advisor and they both believe that this change makes sense, so we will be making the adjustment from 14 days to 10. Uh, the decision is based on what the CDC says is a reduced likelihood of transmitting the virus between days 10 and 14. So this is from the, you know, the, the CDC, the big guns, um, and we're following what they've recommended to us. In terms of the FFC, FFCRA, they, uh, the mandated paid leave that was in place uh, last year ended on December 31st. Um, we are working to make sure as a district that our employees who are forced to quarantine uh, based on exposure to the virus at work are not using their accrued time. But when this ended, it basically says that if you, are, if you need to quarantine due to an outside exposure um, or, or if you have childcare issues, they're no longer covered under FFCRA. So they, you need to use your accrued time as an employee. And if you run out of accrued time, you could possibly end up with an unpaid leave. Um, any employees who are you know, wondering about that have specific questions should contact HR directly. Obviously, we're trying to be as humane as possible, um, but the, the, the law changed for us. So we're following as best we can what the new law says while trying to take care of our employees at the same time. Uh, Wi-Fi access update, as you know, I'm uh, back in December, November, I was uh, concerned about some of the families losing their Wi-Fi access, and we were currently waiting for the shipment from the state. Well, we didn't receive any new um, hotspots from the state, but what we were able to do, and thanks to Omira and Neil's office, we were able to reach out to the districts listed on the screen and ask them if they had any extras. And we are currently in the process of gathering up a total of 76 free hotspots from the state that weren't being used by these districts. And we're going to then change those hotspots out for those families that were using the hotspots the district had to pay for, that we have been uh, struggling with overage charges on, they, they're uh, the Granite Telecommunications hotspots. So we're gonna shift out the free ones for the ones that we're being charged for, but we continue as a district to struggle with this idea that not every one of our families is guaranteed to maintain their Wi-Fi access. Um, and we're gonna do the best we can to sort of try to plug those holes as we learn about them. Um, and there are still uh, different uh, things that uh, Charter has put out there for families, um, but there's, there's, some, there's some pieces that not every family qualifies, so we really have to look at them in, in a case-by-case -case basis and do the best we can. But I just want the board to know that we still are, managing Wi-Fi access is still an issue. Okay, winter sports, I know that I let the board know um, that the CIAC is expected to put out their final decision on January 14th, which is tomorrow. Uh, in our DPH call on Tuesday, they made reference to most states around us already having started their winter sports. They said that 
um, if we end up having winter sports that all of the approved sports will wear masks while they're playing and there'll be mask breaks built in. For Wyndham High School, if we end up having winter sports, we will only be participating in boys and girls basketball. I, I have an extra end there that doesn't need to be there. Um, wrestling, which would have been the other sport offered, um, has been postponed because it is a high risk category. Um, the Board of Ed, you may need to schedule a special meeting next week um, because we're not gonna get the information from the CIAC until tomorrow. I do think it's important that um, we continue what we've done uh, with fall sports in that we need to have schools open in person in order to offer winter sports. I don't think you can have virtual school because it's unsafe and offer winter sports. I think that's a real contradiction. One of the things I'm really concerned about or confused by is this statement that came right out of the winter sports plan from the CIAC. And that is that they reference in this statement um, the towns that are coded as red. Now, Wyndham has been a red town in the red alert zone since October. So this is the CIAC's own concerns about red zones and what they need to do. So I'm, I'm still confused how they're gonna put these two things together, but more to come once uh, the, the final decision from the CIAC comes out tomorrow, and then the board can determine how they wanna proceed with winter sports. Questions were it's good. It's interesting because the latest map of the state has every town except maybe four or five towns red. Right, they're gonna have a hard time competing with sports if the, if we use this language from their own documents. So I don't know if they- It'll, it'll, their... it'll be Granby and Lakeville or something. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, Tracy, please. this is Neil. The, um, I think the DPH call one slide back. It was a different date because you have 121, which didn't happen yet. Oh, so it's supposed to, well, look at that. I transcribed, it's 112. It was uh, Tuesday's call. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Neil. You. Appreciate that. I'll, I'll fix that. Thank you. Good catch. Okay, so I'm trying to be as optimistic as possible and hoping that we are back to some kind of normalcy. I know we're still going to have masks and we're still going to be really cautious, um, but I, by mid-July, I'm hoping. So we've I've started planning and I shared my plan, basics of my plan with the leadership team this week. Um, for in-person summer programs, something that's really fun and exciting and engaging for kids. Um, you know, again, I'm being optimistic. Mid-July is several months away, but I'm just hoping because I've, I've had it with the rest of this stuff. But I am looking to sort of make sure that some of the things I believe about teaching and learning is the one thing I can tell you as a district is as the assistant superintendent, I really didn't get a chance to sort of show you what I believe about teaching and learning. And then I took over a superintendent where I would have, you know, some of the authority to make some changes. And then we ended up in a pandemic just a few months later. So I feel like there's a lot that the district is going to be excited about because I, I, I have I don't know, this whole thing about project based learning and interdisciplinary um, themes and the idea of really engaging learners and getting them want to want to learn. Um, and, and to produce creative ways to show you what they've learned um, is really important to me. So I'm hoping that we can start this in the summer. And if that's not the case, then we're gonna be rolling it out in the fall, hopefully. Um, but we are looking to offer some real in-person uh, summer school if that's gonna be uh, safe to do in July and for the high school students an opportunity for them to recover credit, which Pam and I have been talking probably needs to start long before the summer, given how many kids we know are struggling right now at the high school. State Trace, you have a question? Um, one, are you expecting a larger than normal cohort in the summer because of all of this online learning? I, it, I don't know at the high school, is there a minimum threshold for grades? Students that don't show up, are they getting zeros? Are they, you know, so not, are they getting minimum grades? I don't understand like minimum amount of work. I'm not sure how that's going to work. And then I have a second question. So I, I don't know if I can answer all the questions right now because we're still trying to iron things out. But I do know that the state has given us pretty open guidelines about what we're able to ask kids to do. They, they're basically saying that you have some leeway on what you, what you ask kids to produce to show you that they've mastered standards. Um, so I'm thinking of this summer school, yes, there needs to be, some kids need to be told that they're coming to summer school because they absolutely need to be there. But I want this to be the kind of summer school that kids would actually show up because they're going to get something out of it. It's going to be a fun and engaging way to not only address academics, but to be socially connected to people where every one of us is missing how to be a human in all of this. So right. um, I, I am looking to figure out, I told Rita that 
we need to figure out how to fund this. That's my big thing is how do I, how do I pay for this? Um, but I think that, it, again, if it can't happen in mid-July, it's going to happen in the fall of 2021. Um, but we are aware. We have a number of kids that are not doing well. Um, and I can tell everyone, I, I, you know, I have, my son has been accepted to colleges in a pharmacy program. He's a smart kid. He is struggling in this environment. And it's not because he can't do the work. It's because it's really hard to be on a screen like this all day long. It's just, it's a nightmare. So um, I know that there are many other kids that don't have the support system that my son has at home that have to be struggling a hundred times over. So I, a lot of kids are gonna, are, could potentially benefit from something like this when we're able to, to do it. Yeah, no, I don't yeah, disagree. Another, Andrew, struggled, Andrew struggled hugely trying to get through his fall semester. And you know, he's not a dumb kid right. and he's a fairly conscientious student, but sitting in front of that screen, his leg going, the TV's going, the radio's going, I'm not even knowing how he's understanding what's going on in the computer. And you know, he got it, but he had to have all that other distraction. And as soon as class was over, he was out running the dog or doing something um, active because it was really hard for him to sit. And his classes were broken up over time. Like, you know, we'd have an hour long class and then have an hour off. These students don't always have that when they're virtual. So um, that's something. And also, are you considering half days or whole days? So I know we've done a little bit of both in the past and air conditioning and, you know, heat obviously yeah. is a problem in July. So I was, I, I did put out to the leadership team that my original plan was to create a, like a school day experience. Um, but one of the pieces of feedback the leadership team gave me was about um, not all of our buildings are able to offer a climate controlled environment. We obviously can use barrows. And as long as the HVAC is working, we'll have AC there. Um, but yeah, that was one of the pieces of feedback the leadership team gave me. I haven't really, I have to think about it, but I really want to try to recreate, even if the kids just come for one week at a time, to recreate a real live school situation because they haven't had it now. They've had an unusual situation since March 16th, either no school, fully right. virtual or some hybrid weirdness. So um, more to come on this. And again, it all depends on the circumstances in terms of health and safety. Thank you, I appreciate your answers. Mm -hmm. uh, just an update on the budget process for the whole board. So we are on target with the budget calendar. Kudos to my team. All schools and departments have had their budgeted budgets reviewed. Uh, we have a meeting with Lockton um, on January 20th. Principals are going to be updating their SGCs and having the SGC sign off on their budget requests. I can tell you from the conversations with all the principals, um, we know that we're going to need more than we have this year to get to give the kids what they need when we come back fully in person. Um, and that's mentioned in one of the bullets here. Um, we are aware there's going to be a significant deficit in our uh, food services budget and and I'll be sharing the specifics Rita and I and Neil will be sharing the specifics with finance and audit uh, next week and then with the Board of Finance moving forward from there. Um, we do anticipate there being a surplus in the general budget funds because we have received CARES funds um, and because when you're fully virtual there are things you're not spending money on that you normally would be. Um, and then there's some other unusual circumstances that have come about that have created potential surplus. So we'll be talking to the finance and audit about that. Um, again, we know we're gonna need things for 2021, 22 that we may not have in place right now. So that's gonna be an interesting walk. Um, but everyone has been affected by what's happening and schools are gonna need to respond to that, whether it's academic or social emotional. I, I just thank you. I'd just like to interject here to remind board members that we have two budget workshops scheduled. Uh, I think one is like for the 17th of uh, February and one for March 3rd, I think. That's correct. That's correct. Um, and I want to make sure you have those dates in your calendar. Um, and also, uh, We've been communicating with Tyler Griffin, the chair of the Board of Finance. He re reached out again today to say how important it is for us to have good communication during the budget process. He would like to attend our, you know, attend or have somebody from the board attend our workshops and finance and audit committee meetings. So I just want to remind Mark Doyle. Um, in particular, to make sure that invites go out to the Board of Finance. Thank you, Mark. And um, we'll make sure, I've already told Tyler about the workshop dates. And um, if any board members have any ideas about budget process and how to make it uh, 
run as smoothly as possible in communicating with uh, voters and the, um, and the Board of Finance. Please think about that stuff. Also, I wanna welcome anybody else on this call to reach out to me if they have thoughts about how to make the budget process be as positive as possible. Um, I also wanna forewarn board members that there are gonna be two new members on the Board of Finance. One was just recently seated and there will be, a, a, there is another vacancy on the Board of Finance as Cindy LaQuire had to move out of town. So there will be a new, two new Board of Finance members who have never been through the budget process yet. And last but not least, just an update on the elementary school consolidation. Um, the original information was shared at the board retreat in October. The ad hoc committee was put together and then they met at the end of November. Um, as it stands right now, our goal is to close one of our elementary schools for the start of the 22-23 school year. So we're not going to even try to consider that next year, given all that's going on right now and all that we know is going to be, we're still going to be responding to COVID in next school year. There's no way around it. Um, right now, two schools that are up for consideration are Wyndham Center School, which is our smallest, and Natchog School, which is our oldest. Um, the ad hoc committee, I sent out an email, we just have to narrow down the date, will be scheduled for a meeting in January, um, sometime next week. Um, the goal will be for that committee to make a recommendation to the board and for the board to vote on which of the schools will be closed in February. Then, um, then there'll be a, well, there's already an idea for a communication plan, but a formal communication plan will be put out and opportunities for staff, students, and families to share their concerns to answer questions and just truly understand what the closure of a school will mean for them and their kiddos. Um, and the only other thing I just put up here is the draft statement, sort of the rationale behind why we're even considering um, closing a school. Uh, and what it really comes down to is we think this is an opportunity for us to offer our kids um, things that they may not currently have um, by reallocating human and instructional resources. And the reality is we have one more building that houses elementary students than we did back in 2012-13. Um, and there's, I'm trying to think of how to say it. Um, there's, there's 250 less students going into, right, Neil, how am I saying that? 250 less students are now being fit into five buildings when they used to only be four. Right, and, and just yes. from the several years, that, you know, the five, six years I've been here, our student populations have decreased by in elementary grades by two to 300 students. So this is an opportunity to make a fiscally responsible decision and at the same time offer our students some things they may not currently have and to standardize staffing structures and class sizes and, and put kids first and hopefully in, in, improve achievement for all of our elementary school students. More to come on that. I just, I just wanna interject here that um, there are some questions that have been raised in the chat, which we will um, deal with uh, regarding school consolidation. I, more information and more discussion will be had publicly about this. This preview really is for the for people to be signal. I mean, for there to be a signal that the board will be having more discussions about that. And the discussions when we come. In, in, in February are open to the public because that is when the school board will be having the full discussion about this and the public will be able to give us feedback. And also, then there will be an entire process mm -hmm. as we move toward the consolidation over a period of time that will include input and discussion with the public and with parents and other folks, I know it's a very scary, emotional thing. Um, and I want people to understand that we're not um, trying to do it behind closed doors. Um, that is why I asked for there to be a report on what the process was going to be next at tonight's meeting. And um, I also, there was a question in the chat about paras and um, at which we're not going to discuss here at the board meeting. Um, I think it's more of a personnel human resources issue. And I just want to bring it to um, 
Stephanie or somebody's uh, attention and could you please make sure you follow up with, I don't know who CF is. Yeah, th that employee should definitely call HR or email HR. I'm not sure who they are either, but um, they can explain all of the reasons why the decisions have been made and what the district has to do. Thank you. So um, with that, we're gonna open it up to discussion and I'm particularly interested in hearing um, from board members, uh, if you have any questions, concerns, things that you would like to share regarding um, how the district is dealing with COVID. Oh, hi, Lynn. This is Mary. Yeah, hi, Mary. Go ahead. Hi. Um, yes, um, I, I did want to um, make some comments about um, the COVID issue since that really is the most um, urgent and unusual issue that we have to confront. Um, and again, just saying thank you to the staff of Wyndham Public Schools, uh, from the nurses and, and the teachers, everybody has, has made such a great um, effort during this trying time. And of course, to the students who have had to suffer through a really um, what's at times overwhelming um, times that in the country and the world. So um, with that preface, I want to say, I am very concerned about opening um, next week. Um, for one thing, we're at our, the highest level we've been in the nation, okay, and the state. And we have a looming um, uh, strain that's more contagious. Um, I'm very concerned to see the CDC uh, reducing, you know, quarantine times when we now have a new, more contagious strain and we don't know if that remains in the system. And uh, so, so to me, there are so many um, unknowns from a scientific and a medical viewpoint. Um, and I wanna say specifically about the town's numbers. Um, for one thing, we, we really, really cannot say for certain about transmission in schools. First of all, if every student was tested so that we, we had baseline of everybody, we would know if they've been exposed. Um, and there are asymptomatic cases and, ch and children may have a sturdier immune response to this, at least to the strain we've been familiar with. The new one is unknown. So we, there could be actually a lot of cases floating around in schools that the uh, asymptomatic children will not betray to our current ways of collecting data. Um, so, so we have to be careful about that. Next, when I saw the slide that talked about the current cases and the resolved cases, and they add up to 715 students, and, and that's like almost 25% of our student body. I, I just think that is very alarming um, and concerning. I, I know people have gotten over this, um, and resolved is good, um, I think, but uh, I just think that to me is a disturbing figure that we are really living in unprecedented times with a very poor response to, from our nation, which is a very developed and educated nation. And we see that we have the most awful numbers in the world. So I, I am just putting out there, I'm uncomfortable going to any sort of in-person or hybrid in-person just for these concerning you know, weeks before we really roll out the vaccinations and we really understand this new strain. Um, you know, starting again next week, and, and the students are depressed about <laughs> the changes, but we cannot help them completely until things really are under control. Um, so I don't want to take up too much time, but those are my concerns. Thank you, Mary. Is there anybody else um, who would like to speak up from the board? I would Tracy. if I may. Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, I just, I want to kind of echo Mary's sentiments that we have to be concerned for our students and we have to watch out for that. But we also have to be concerned for the people in the buildings, certified staff, uncertified staff, teachers, nurses, administration, who care for them and who are in contact with them every day. I'm looking at you know the numbers that Dr. Youngberg put up earlier and the, the town ahead of us, Basra, I believe it was, I don't have the screen in front of me right now, 
you know, has 107 per 100,000, but in such a small town, that could be one family making that big of a difference. It's not the size of Wyndham, certainly. And so therefore, you know, numbers wise, we are far ahead of all of those other towns. That's concerning for me. A lot of our students go home to multi-generational families. A lot of our teachers that live in the Wyndham area go home and have others that they have to care for. And that just continues to perpetuate the spread of this. And I know Dr. Youngberg has some tough decisions to make and, and I don't envy her those decisions and I know we've put our trust in her. But part of our job is to let her know how we feel about this. And so that's what I'm trying to do here, you know, in a formal setting. Um, a lot of teachers, a lot of parents have expressed their concern to me. Some parents didn't know that we were going back on the 20th. And when I was talking about that, I saw a couple parents at work. They're like, why would we go back? Everybody's so sick. And so people either aren't aware, which is something else we have to address, or they're concerned about sending their students back. And at some point it's going to be, we're teaching, I know in the high school it already is, we're teaching more students online than we are in person. I know connectivity issues are a problem. I know students falling behind and being in contact are a problem. I know there's a whole host of other problems that we're looking at. And maybe we need to split it between middle and high school and elementary schools. Maybe that's the best way to do it because the elementary school students will, you know, do better in class and the high school and middle school students can do better in person. I'm not sure how any of that, you know, what the correct answer is. And I'm glad that Dr. Youngberg continues to give us the information that she's receiving from the Department of Health and the CDC and the State Department of Education. I just wanted to give my two cents on that. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Is there anybody else on the board who, Paula, I see you and then Mark. Paula and then Mark. Um, having Having been going through this uh, for many, many months in my job, the most important thing really comes down to whether or not we can maintain the proper mitigating uh, precautions. Um, we have to be able to social distance. We have to be able to ensure people are wearing proper PEE. I mean, it, that's really what it comes down to. I don't know how difficult that is to manage in our classrooms, um, but I think that has to be a, a major consideration um, before we can go back. Do we have the ability to properly social distance? Do we have the equipment that we need um, in order to protect ourselves and others around us? Um, that has been what has managed. It's when people do not use those mitigating situations that the virus gets through and becomes very contagious. Thank you, Paula. Um, Mark, you had your hand up next? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I have two concerns. The, the one concern about the high school is that we have such a poor attendance record when we go, when we go, when we go in, in class that I wonder if virtual isn't a better way of going anyway, because you, you've given us numbers like four or five kids show up for a class and then the attendance has been so poor. I, I'm, I'm concerned about doing this and not still not getting the attendance with, with, the, with the high school kids. And as far as the, the younger group, I, I guess I'm tending to believe that it's not school transmitted, just looking at the microcosm of my own neighborhood up in the Summit Street area, I would have to say 90% of the families around me are not wearing masks during the day. They're not socially distancing. They're in large family groupings. Uh, the kids may be better off in school because they're they're certainly not getting, just looking at the microcosm of my neighborhood, they're, they're just not getting the same distancing and and uh, protection from, from the covert spread that they would get at school. Thank you, Mark. Is there any other board member who would like to ask any questions? Uh, Dr. Youngberg, is there anything you want to say in response to uh, anything you or your team want to say in response to what the board members have put out? I, I definitely appreciate the feedback. Um, you know, it's a, it's a tough decision to make. Um, obviously, I'm thinking about people's safety every single minute of every single day. Um, and I do think that there, there are benefits to being in person. So if I say that we should advocate for students and offer the opportunity for in person, then it could be construed that I'm not thinking about the safety of my staff. And of course I am. And then I know that there's community people that reach out on a regular basis and say, you know, your job is to, is to be, ensure my kids 
get the schooling they deserve. You know, you're, you're a, a, your salary is paid by taxpayer dollars. So you need to open up your schools. We're paying your salary. So it's a, we're in a tough position and I understand everyone's, you know, uh, we're under a lot of pressure. And um, I was taken aback by the information that was shared at tonight's five o'clock meeting. I felt like when I was listening to them talk about the things they were saying about Eastern Connecticut and our current numbers and, and the unlikelihood of a vaccine showing up anytime soon, I definitely know that that made me say, wait a second, this is not exactly what I thought we were dealing with, you know, when I was talking to people earlier today. Um, but I, I, whatever decision is made, I feel like someone is not getting what they need and it. It makes me kind of sick in my stomach. So I, um, I think this is a, you know, a very, very uh, important, it seems like with COVID, we found that all these things we thought were going to be like, this is the pinnacle of this. This is when we're going to, the, 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 the trajectory is going to change everything. It hasn't been working out that way. Um, and, you know, I want to say that maybe my feelings are influenced. I've, I've talked to Dr. Youngberg about this by the fact that I have two, two of my three children actually work in classrooms every day. And so I hear from them about the reality of what it's like. Now, they're not with high school kids. Well, actually, my, my youngest is with high school kids. But um, the, uh, it's not the same situation as it is for my brother, for example, who teaches at a private school that is a boarding school where you can control what those kids are doing 24 seven because their life is scheduled and the atmosphere, I mean, the situations that they're in are all predetermined. But when a child gets off the school bus, you just don't know what's happening in the household or in the neighborhood. Uh, I will say in my neighborhood where I live, kids are out running around with each other outside of school with no masks, mixing families, doing whatever all weekend and afternoon. So it's, it's a very tough situation. Um, I believe that ultimately it is your decision, Dr. Youngberg, um, to make. I think you are hearing from board members that they are very concerned. And um, uh, it's, it's almost a no-win situation. I mean, there are parents who have, have communicated saying how much they want their children to have the opportunity to be back in school. One parent just wrote um, that he had to go off to a meeting but maybe we should wait. My kids need school in person, but going back and forth is difficult. I, I do want to end by saying, I reiterating what I said in December that I think going back and forth is difficult. Um, and I worry about us going back for a week or two and then deciding that we have to go back out again. Um, so uh, just want to put that out there. Thank you. Um, Tracy? One more question. Mm -hmm. Have we heard anything about testing? Um, I know like SBAC testing and stuff like that is probably not going to happen for the year. SATs, that's, you know, another benchmark for the high school. How do we get all these kids to take this test if we're only so seeing, you know, you, you 90 would, or 80 percent of them? You would think that testing wasn't going to happen, but that's actually not the case. Neil, you want to fill her in? Currently from the the Connecticut State Department of Education, all of our testing, including our Lost Links testing, our SBAC testing, I do believe our SAT test is all currently on schedule to occur. Um, currently, we're requesting, well, not we, meaning me, but um, the Connecticut State Department of Education is requesting an accountability waiver so that the, in other words, the scores don't count towards any sort of school status and no participation requirements are in play. But um, in order to do that, we'd have to administer the exams. That is currently what the, the state has been telling us. But how do we administer the exams when you can only have so many students in a classroom six feet apart, blah, blah, blah. Like you're going to do 24-hour exams and have them come in at each assigned hour or something? 
They're, they're um, actually trying to figure out how to administer it from where the kids are at home. It's a... Uh, I can well, talk to you. As, as a board member, I would like you to know that if you need me to advocate to the state or something else, I would be happy to start a letter writing campaign or whatever we need to do to make this happen safely or not at all if that's what we need to do this year. If the waiver doesn't come through, if there's something like that you need me to do, I'll start calling on anybody I know in the community. I'll do a, you know, a form letter and have them all start sending it. I don't know who they'll send it to because as of next week, Dr. Cardona has a new job, but, um, but I will get something sent out to whoever we have to to advocate for that because having our kids in school is difficult enough. Having them 30 in a classroom or something seems nearly impossible and definitely anti-health wise. So, so the, thank you very much for offering that. We, and I may come back and ask you for support. The Alliance District Superintendents, um, which represent a, you know, a very large population of the state in terms of student population, have already put together a letter expressing, and we met with Ajit from the state, and we've expressed our concerns, not only because it's just the implementation of the assessments, um, the, the you know, how students are feeling about assessments, how you're gonna actually be able to, to administer, um, but the fact that all of the districts are in different, are in various states of learning models, and every district has a different, you know, extenuating set of circumstances, and how are you gonna use this data to do anything when we're not even sure you can collect the data in, a, in, an, effective, in an effective way. And our own internal assessments have shown us that we can't necessarily rely on students taking assessments outside of school. Um, right, Neil, you can, you can add to that, but. Yeah, so we know, especially in our primary grades, that either we have um, triple the amount of reading proficiency in the middle of a pandemic, or there are some issues with testing virtually. I'm going to go with the latter theory. Right. Um, and, and so what there, an amazing legacy for me if that were the case, right? Yeah. That would be pretty awesome. It would be incredible. <laughs> um, but yes, there are definite issues with it and we're aware of it. And, and I appreciate your comments, like uh, Dr. Youngberg said. And I can assure you that first and foremost, testing will happen in a safe environment or not at all. Okay, thank you. Yep. So I noticed that... Um, a comment in the chat. I know I'm not supposed to directly um, address, you know, comments. I, I, you know, I understand the parameters, but I want to make sure that I that I say it out loud that I completely know that my staff members are working um, their tails off at home. And even though we're fully virtual, I'm not in any way implying that they're not working because I know I know exactly what goes into a 12-hour day on the teaching side. Trust me on this one. I see it every single day. So I, I get it. Are there any other comments that board or questions that board members would like to raise before we move on to the next item on the agenda? Uh, I want to just ask the question, board members. Um, do you feel that we should proactively schedule a special meeting for next week and not have it if we don't need it? given the winter sports issue that may come up, as well as Dr. Youngberg may want us to meet again about COVID. Uh, uh, do we um, want to do it? What, what night next week would we want to do it? Monday is a holiday. Wednesday, like we normally do? Does Wednesday work for folks? Yeah. I, w I wanted to ask if we could have it at a different time on Wednesday because it is a Board of Finance meeting. That, I, I would like I to go. Say that we're going to be. would like to go. We, we've tried to be, we've tried to have attendance at the Board of Finance meetings. I think it's important. And they meet at seven. Uh, if that's the case, could, I, I would say move it to Thursday. We've got a finance committee meeting that I have to have on Wednesday at six. So, yeah, just make it another day. Make it Thursday. Could we could we have it at five? Sure. So let me just ask this question: If we wait till Thursday to have a meeting, or and yeah, it, well, and, we won't be back discussing in school and winter sports. I mean, we really have to have it before if we go back to school. 
in the event we go back to school and winter sports is supposed to start. So. Okay. Well, I can move. Tuesday? I can move the finance committee meeting an hour earlier, and we could either do it at do the board at five or the or the board at six, and I'll just move the finance committee around. Can it. the board members give me a thumbs up if they could do a meeting at five? Say that again, Lynn. Could you could you give me a thumbs up if you could do a meeting at five next Wednesday? Five's tough for me. Five's tough for you. Okay. So how about six, Paula? If if we flipped the finance and audit committee meeting to five, and then add six the board is meeting at six. Okay. So we'll have a special meeting next Wednesday at six p.m. and we'll try to move the board. Mark will work to move the finance and audit committee up to five. I'll talk to the chairman. Okay. So, <laughs> Lynn, just for clarification, are is that a meeting that's going to address the COVID um, coming back to school? Or are you still giving me the permission to make those decisions? I'm giving you permission to make the decision, but I want to have a special meeting on the agenda. Okay. In case we need it. This is for sports though, right? That's right. what we're it, talking it about. It would be for sports and, and I think it should be notice sports and anything else related to okay. COVID because I want to keep it open in case okay. Dr. Youngberg comes back to us on Tuesday and says there's new information and I think we should have a discussion or something like that. Okay? Thank you. Okay, thanks folks. Um, so... The next item of business are committee reports. Um, Mark, is there anything to report from finance and audit? Uh, just that we're gonna have our meeting next week at uh, at six. No, at five. Oh, five, we're gonna have a meeting next week at five. I didn't talk to me yet, okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, school planning and design. I know you guys have been busy. That's me, I have to remember to unmute. We did meet last week. Um, we had a very um, productive meeting. We talked about um, how the schools are moving, sorry, I have to wear my glasses while I'm doing this, I'm getting old, moving along and, um, and how the air handling and the heating is going. It's going moderately well. Um, at least three of the classroom, three of the buildings are complete. Natchog had the gym heater on the fritz last week. Um, Sweeney has the gym air handling unit is working, it just needs regular preventative maintenance. Um, North Wyndham had three exhaust fans and ventilators they were still working on, and the high school um, has moderate and small repairs that are still ongoing there, but we've made a million percent increase in air handling and um, heat exchange and stuff like that since we first got this report back in late August. So they've made really good progress there. They're still working on things, but this time of year between heat and air, flow and stuff like that, they're always working on things in our buildings because they're so old. So none of this is unusual. Um, we have been working with um, a company about solar panels at North Wyndham and Barrows. North Wyndham, yes. Yes, North Wyndham and Barrows. And um, we're continuing to work on those. We have um, one of the Shipman and Goodwin attorneys working with us on that. And there was a tentative agreement with some changes that has been circulated. Dr. Youngberg shared that with me. Um, they're going to be um, waiting for signatures from Jim Rivers. I don't know if Dr. Youngberg had a chance to follow up on that. I haven't had a chance to catch her ear. Um, I haven't tried, it's not her fault. Um, <laughs> um, about signing the contracts for the oil tank removals and replacement in two of the buildings and the new roof for North Wyndham. The contracts are in place. Um, they did an interview and hired Fryer to work on both of those projects. So hopefully that will be underway soon. Um, and the middle school is having new water fountains installed. That comes from capital improvement funds. That's been on the, the books for a little while. Um, and they will be taped off on the bottom where the, the bubbler part is, for lack of a better word. But the water bottle top part will still be accessible. We also had a brief discussion because um, the Wyndham Center principal was also on the call. We had a brief discussion about the sulfur smell in the water fountains and in the drinking water at Wyndham Center School. And Dawn is going to take a look into that and hopefully I'll have more to report on my, at my next committee meeting. 
Does anybody have any questions for Tracy? I guess not. You're, it was a very clear report. A lot I take notes that way I can give it back. Yeah. Um, and the high school renovation committee is moving along. Um, we talked about funding and the PLA um, agreement is in the works between the town and the um, building committee. Very exciting. That's it. Any questions on that? from the board. Okay, uh, policy committee. Ilda, is there anything to report? Um, only that we had a very productive meeting last month. Um, we looked at several policies and we, are, we, we brought some to you for the first reading. And our next meeting is on the 28th okay. at five o'clock. Or four o'clock. I don't even remember anymore. Five or four. It seems to me that you usually meet like late afternoon. So mm -hmm. I'm sure it's 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 no. It's at four. We change it to yeah. four. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Any questions on policy? And there's nothing new to report from the executive committee at this point. Um, I know that Mary Gallucci did circulate to board members uh, documents last week uh, regarding the uh, superintendent's evaluation process and tool. And I encourage board members to respond to Mary about that. Um, if you have any suggestions, comments, questions, we wanna make sure we keep all that moving along. Okay, um, so we'll move on to action items. Um, before we move on to action items, I, I think there may be a little bit of confusion. Uh, I, I just wanna clarify, we are leaving the decision with Dr. Youngberg about what to do about the schools. Um, we are scheduling a special meeting for next Wednesday um, if we need to have one to deal with winter sports because uh, CIAC and customary manner is not making decisions until like we're on the cusp of starting something. Um, and then we also could be talking about anything else related to COVID as the superintendent superintendent and board of ed determine is necessary. Okay. So I don't want there to be confusion. It's not like we're punting a big decision on hybrid opening, not opening virtual, whatever until next Wednesday. This is the superintendent's decision. Part of the reason we talked about it at length this evening was so that she could hear from the board to factor that into her decision making. Okay. But I don't want there to be a misunderstanding as somebody put in the comment that we're waiting until next Wednesday to make a decision. Okay. Oh, I'm glad you thought that clarification made sense. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, next item is um, action items. We have approval of a proposed district calendar for 2021-2021-22. And um, we've, we've seen this, we've had the first reading. I would entertain a motion. So moved, no Tracy. Moved seconded by Tracy, by seconded by Ilda. Any discussion? Let's hope that we can start in person on the 26th of August. Fully in person, right? Yes. <laughs> Without masks, maybe, but I don't know. I'm not optimistic. No, don't push your luck, Lynn. Don't you? <laughs> but, but um, okay. So I guess we'll take a roll call. Ms. I. I. Dr. Gallucci. I. Mr. Doyle. I. Ms. Lambert. I. Ms. Ray. 
Aye. Ms. Haney. Aye. Motion passes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next item of business is approval of acceptance of a $1,000 donation to the Wyndham Early, Ch Early Childhood Autism, pro Autism Program for the, from the Leo, J and Rose Pago Trust. Pagano Trust, I move that. Second. With gratitude. Yes, with gratitude. So motion made by Tracy, seconded by Mark. Any discussion? I'm assuming everybody wants to take the acknowledge the donation. Okay, uh, I guess we'll take a roll call vote on that, please. Miss I. I. Dr. Gallucci. I. Mr. Doyle. I. Ms. Lambert. I. Ms. Ray. I graciously. Ms. Haney? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. And that concludes our business for the evening. Um, we're opening it up to public comment at this point. Is there anybody who would like to speak? Okay. Hearing no people and seeing no hands, I am going to entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. I move, we move. Second. Motion made by Tracy, seconded by Mark. Meeting adjourned at 848. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good, good night. night. Good night. Good night, good night.